Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This month's writer is Marianne de Piers, international best-selling author of the Parish Plessy and Sentience of Orion series. Marianne's story for TISF, In the Book Shadow, shows that the job of bookshop sales assistant may be more fraught with weirdness and danger than you might at first imagine. I thought of the shop as a halfway house, a place in the shadows for people of the shadows. Strangely enough, it was its most dangerous in the height of summer, when the outside world was hot and sharp, the shadow people saw it blur. I arrived every morning on the 8.15 train, pressed awkwardly between the already perspiring bodies of commuters, and trudged along the subway that led from the station under the roadway into the back of the arcade. The arcade had been recently renovated, and the air-conditioning circulated air at a pleasant 19 degrees, cool enough to make me shiver at the transition. The surfaces of the main food hall gleamed with the smart light of expensive marble tiling. The sushi bar was clean and crisp, the chef polishing his knives. The florist fussed, tethering balloons to floral arrangements. Along one subdued arm of the arcade in the coolest, darkest corner was the bookshop, a place only likely to be discovered by a combination of luck and afternoon's aimless wandering. The window was well-dressed, full of bold-covered new release books. Inside was a smorgasbord of crime, horror, science fiction, fantasy and all those in-between stories that had no home. The clientele was mostly dedicated regulars, a blend of young straggly intellectuals, middle-aged freethinkers and some genuine freaks. Occasionally, bright young office workers flaunting iron shirts and nose rings stumbled in, quickly snatching up a light romance or a murder mystery, but the shop lived and breathed by its hard core. Mostly, I worked with Sean. He was a charming urban boy with a knack for selling to anyone who could hold a half-decent conversation. I, on the other hand, specialised in the others. Others, like Mink, the tragic drug-fucked street poet, a one-time writer raped by the publishing world and cast adrift, or Duro, the compulsive shoplifter, a small, furtive man who survived on what he could steal when he wasn't in jail. Then there was Grace, a withdrawn spinster who rarely spoke and had lived all her life with her alcoholic father, Seb, the homeless, disturbed teenager, and Celestial with a hideously disfigured face. I gradually learned their whims just as I pieced together their life stories, Now I could pick the days Juro was likely to steal, the days when he'd have a handful of coins in his pocket enough to buy a sci-fi classic in cut-price format. I learned to read Celestial's lips, despite the spittle that gathered in the corners and forced her to dab at them furiously. I learned when Grace wanted help choosing something with her pension money and when she was likely to slip a pocket knife from her purse and thrust the blade at me if I interfered with her browsing. I sensed when Seb's abusive mother had given him money or whether it was safe to recommend a hard-boiled crime novel, or if he was likely to forget himself and practice stalking techniques on the girls from the bank. I knew when Mink could stand a sad ending. Sean watched me with contemptuous laughter as I petted and chivied my others. Why do you waste your time? We don't want them in here, he complained one day as I chased Juro out of the shop for slipping a Zelazny omnibus in his baggy thief's trousers. They've got no money, not like Peter or Sharon. Dr Peter Lowe and Sharon Greystone were two of our best customers, voracious readers with eclectic tastes and ready incomes. Sean coloured pheromonal when they called in. This place anchors them, I explained, not expecting him to understand. It's somewhere to come. Things don't change here. They feel safe. I understood, because I was really one of them, disguised in my shabby sales assistant's clothes. 
Sean was young, vibrant and capable. Life hadn't even begun to digest his hope. He shook his artfully blonde hair impatiently. You should be working in a crisis centre, not a bookshop. This is a business. Yes, I agree. But it was other things as well. Sean turned away in irritation. Some days I could tell he loathed me. The other things weren't just my curious human clientele. It began when Sean was on his lunch breaks, increasing slowly to whenever he was out of the shop at the bank or the post office or wherever else he scurried to during his outings. The first time, one appeared on a publisher's display stand, nine pockets of new books by one author, an epic fantasy of the type that were numbingly popular, a mere flickering in my corner sight. I glanced up from my invoicing, thinking a customer had entered quietly, probably Juro sneaking in while I was busy. It was not Juro or any other customer. It resembled a large bat, a shadowy, evil, unblinking creature with wings and talons that pierced the cardboard on which it perched. The air in front of it rippled as if I was watching through slow-moving water. What? But before I could move or speak properly, the door to the shop opened and Grace entered. I called excitedly to her and pointed, Grace, do you see that? She shrank back at my forthright approach and I worried for a moment she might leave. I tempered my voice to a gentle cajoling. On the book stand, can you see that thing? Reassured as a nervous animal might be, she stepped around the shelf of true crime to oblige my question. The creature was still there, silently malevolent and unmoving. Grace froze, her thin, withered face drained of all colour. You see it, don't you, Grace? I couldn't control the shrill in my voice. She stared at the creature. After a long moment, she fished in her bag and produced a chain which she slipped around her neck, not a cross but a misshapen medallion. The door banged open again. Sean entered, chewing on the remnants of his lunch. Sorry, got caught. Something wrong? He stopped, bemused, his head pivoting between Grace and I. Grace hissed. I looked back across to the stand. The creature had disappeared. As I stood gasping, Grace saved me from idiocy. Sick. She grasped her belly. Need air. I'll help Grace outside, Sean, I croaked, recovering. We stumbled outside together. I touched her arm. What is it, Grace? What was it? She drew her thin arms around herself until she appeared shrunken. Her hand slipped into her bag and retrieved her knife. Keep away. She said it in a firm voice, not frightened or hysterical as I felt. It was almost as if this event was not peculiar. I shook the notion from my head and let my hand fall. Grace edged quietly into the people mainstream of the arcade and disappeared. I returned to the shop. It was thick with a putrid odour. Sean was unpacking books. That woman needs to wash. I nodded absently. The smell I knew had nothing to do with Grace. I took the book home that night and read it. It was one of those tragically detailed fantasy stories full of boring routine imagery and cliched prose. Yet, feeling an urgency to explain the vision Grace and I had shared, had we really shared it? The book seemed the only clue. But the reading gave me no comfort and I lay restlessly awake into the night. As I left my apartment for work the next morning, tired and nervous, I noticed a drunk asleep in the gutter. The sight itself was not uncommon near my stingy rental, yet something in the cast of the body, perhaps the gaudy pseudo-fur coat, captured my attention. Mink, is that you? I called to him softly. The pile of papers and ragged clothes moved, standing shakily. Mink, this is not your patch, I said, astonished. His glassy green eyes stared wildly at me. He seemed agitated, strung out. I stepped closer, enough to taste his fetid breath. But he backed away, whispering in his hoarse, once performer's voice, Suffer their vain glory. He shuffled away, out of sight. From there began a nightmare of days and nights. I ate little and slept less. I began to dread Sean leaving the shop, for the visions came regularly sometimes in the shape of wild, fearsome, fantastic animals, sometimes just nebulous glowing patches of density. The latter were worse, almost, for it seemed that the less form the vision took, the stronger its emanations of raw malevolence and fury. Sometimes I would be entirely alone in the shop when it happened, at other times amidst a handful of customers. I would be the only one aware of the shrieking demon renting flesh from the limp form of a corpse. One time, as I served Sharon Greystone, a vision of an angry man with two knives appeared behind her. He reached one to her throat and one to her belly. It cost me everything to stop from crying out. Yet I must have lurched awkwardly, even violently, towards her. 
She did not flinch, but I saw fearful speculation in her eyes. Is there a problem, she asked politely. Yes, I was desperate to scream. Behind you, about to gut you, slit your throat. The door opened, a distracting movement, rescuing me from an outburst of paranoid insanity. Seb prowled in and began roving up and down the shelves. He glanced repeatedly at Sharon Greystone and myself, his hands fluttering in little circular movements, his lips moving silently, praying I was sure. I was also sure he could see the vision, as Grace had done weeks before. Slowly the vision faded. Sharon Greystone collected her purchases and coolly left. Her calm did not deceive me, though. I knew she would speak quietly to Glenn and I would now be scrutinised, my performance more closely monitored. Seb came to the counter. Did you? I began. But he slapped a vintage J.G. Ballard on the counter as if to chop off my words. I took the book in my hands. It was the tale of psychological and physical survival, a thrilling, introspective masterpiece in its own way, not the sort of story Seb would normally buy. Safest, he mumbled and left. The visions heightened. Daytime nightmares. I battled for perspective for a reason. I sought help with a psychiatrist. With a smoothing of her carefully pinned hair, she began to make immediate confinement plans for me, whispering coded messages into her audio diary. I gave her a false address and cancelled my next appointment. Sean watched me, only leaving the shop for ten minutes at a time. It should have been a relief. Instead, each day became dotted with short, intense bursts of violent visions. Guillotines, hangmen's nooses or presences pulsating with envy, jealousy and hate. The others haunted the shop too. Through a haze of misery, I saw them, though I had ceased being able to pander to their wants. Their appearance became almost routine. Grace or Celestial in the morning, Seb or Juro in the afternoons. None of them speaking or buying, just prowling the shelves like freakish guardians. Grace stroked the spines of crime and passion stories as though they were her longed-for lovers. Celestial poured over book covers of ravishing heroines with a corporeal yearning. Seb handled fantasy sagas like they were siblings reciting whole passages out loud, and Juro stole bookmarks. Had I been myself, the sight of their emotional impoverishment would have wrenched my insides. Shining Sean hastened to wipe and dust when they left as though their touch had debased things. I also noticed Mink, living permanently on the street outside my flat. I recognised the coat. We didn't speak, but his presence gave me strange comfort. Somewhere, my life had unwound. By their presence alone, the others were lending me a thing I had once sought to afford them. Celestial dropped the first clue. Through dribble and spit, she whispered the three words from her disfigured mouth. Fear the writer. Then she scuttled to the back of the shop amongst the darkened shelves and took up her patrol. As if I had been dangled a rope with which to pull myself from quicksand, I clawed back towards sanity. I pondered over Mink's few words spoken weeks before. Suffer their vainglory. Whose vainglory? When the next vision came... A severed limb draped across a customer's shoulder. I breathed deeply and concentrated on the sale. The book they were purchasing was a thriller, a type that championed blood and cheap fear. Soon I began to see a pattern. The visions accompanied what I had always considered ugly books, where the writer had churned out careless words, driven by their desire to compete in a voracious industry. As I saw them, soulless books. Fear the writer, Celestial had told me. Feverishly, I read author biographies and studied their photos. Behind the grainy black and white portraits on dust covers, I began to see dark images. Shapes of evil lurking behind posed smiles and faraway stares. A comprehension totally fanciful settled across my mind. I resolved within me that the tortuous visions were escapees from books. Greedy, dark writers' animas. Souls that had sold. What a fantastic conception. But right, I felt it. I knew it. It brought little solace. Why was I played with their presence? Why not shining Sean with his pert sales talk and invincible taut flesh? I stewed on my misfortune, building an anger so intense that it burnt away my fear and scoured my confusion. I came to work charged with energy and ragged truculence. I began to wage a battle. That's a terrible book, I told customers. Not worth the paper. You're wasting your money. I sold only books I believed in, the books in which I could detect an intact writer's soul. Who set me in judgment? I did. Survival can teach you anything, make you anything. But the visions worsened still, materialising whether Sean was present or not. 
Cuts, bruises and unexplained burns started to appear on my body like I'd been performing small self-mutilations. Sometimes invisible fingers pressed at my throat make it impossible to breathe. Sean began hushed behind his hand phone calls, discussing my deteriorating appearance with the shop's owners. He took care not to touch me or come close. I noticed he began to hang a heavy bunch of keys from his belt loop. On the last day, Dr Peter Lowe came in. As was his custom, he would begin to harvest books from the shelves. Some visits he would choose twenty or more. Sean fussed around him, relegating me to the background. I lurked like one of the others amongst the shelves, pretending to unpack books. A Stanley knife tight in my grasp, I ran the knife along the taped edge of a box, listening. Something light, Sean. Something easy, full of thrills, he said. I'm on holidays, a trip to the mountains and then a week at the beach. Take me, take me, Sean flirted as he piled soulless upon soulless novel onto the counter. Visions exploded around the pair as they joked. I saw grotesquely murdered bodies that smelt of fresh death and a long-bloodied sword wielded by a skeletal knight. Rage mounted so fast it rushed my crumbling control. I felt the battle line roll over me. No, put them away, I yelled. It's not safe. I lunged at the skeleton knight, meaning to wrestle its sword away, but the knight was stronger. Bearing me forward like a mere decoration on its hilt, it stabbed, not in a clean swipe, but with hacking moves, roughly severing Lowe's head from his neck. The sound of it roared in my ears. The gush of blood choked my nose, spattering my face, and ran into my mouth. Lowe's flesh slippery in my fingers. Sean ran, screaming, screaming, high-pitched and girlish. I called out after him to explain, but my tongue was thick, saturated with the taste of warm metal. The others entered some time later. Juro, Grace, Mink, Celestial, Seb, all of them. They formed a circle of protection, wiping blood from my face and hands. They moved Lowe's body with practiced ease, placing it out of sight behind the counter. Mink's green eyes were calm. Celestial's mouth was dry of spittle. Grace was smiling. Juro patted my arms. Seb placed a misshapen medallion around my neck. I knew them now. Discarded characters from books. Self-appointed guardians of the soul, like me. Cajoling, caring, they steered me out onto the streets to safety. Incognita Speculative Fiction Terror Incognita Reviews This month's review book is Beneath the Dark Eyes by Greg Bick. Beneath the Dark Eyes begins like many a modern day action book with a crack team of scientists and military personnel brought together to mount a rescue mission when a plane crashes in Antarctica. The Hawks, basically Navy SEALs on steroids, are led by Captain Alex Hunter, who's more than your average elite soldier, if those two adjectives can be put together in one sentence. A Soviet bullet lodged in Alex's brain near his hypothalamus, which should have killed if not permanently disabled him, has left him with superhuman strength, speed, agility, senses and intellect. Lucky fella. The team descends into an icy cave opened up by the downed plane and finds ruins of a proto-Mayan civilization. It was at this point I became a little worried. The setup seemed fairly typical of a lot of B-grade actioners. But when our brave chiseled featured hero finally gets beneath the ice, Greg Beck really takes the brakes off and what follows is a hell for leather adventure that is as fast-paced, inventive and page-turning as you could possibly wish. I read the book in two sittings, which is a record for me. Beck knows the geography of his chosen genre. His set pieces are nicely balanced between audience expectation and novelty, which means the reader gets a double payoff. He backs his observations and plot twists with nice research, which is economically introduced and never feels like an info dump. His characters nod towards their stereotypes, but also feel believable, and his female characters are much more than the standard shrinking violet types. I'm not going to tell you what they encounter beneath the dark ice. I don't want to spoil your fun. But what I can say is if you're looking for a great read that plays out like one of the best action movies you've ever seen 
and has more than one spec fic twist, Beneath the Dark Ice is for you. It seems we have a new genre hero, and I'm waiting to see what Captain Alex Hunter does next. Four stars. Beneath the Dark Ice by Greg Beck is published in Australia by Pan Macmillan. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of the publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it.